Uh, if you were here with us last week, you perhaps remember our amazing celebrity um, interviewer, and she is back with us this week to help um, have a conversation with Amy Cuddy. Uh, if you have, if you are new, you will um, know that this person got her graduate degree in journalism, after which she immediately went on to a career in tech in California and Toronto. Later, she was the founder of the editorial.com, where she wrote extensively about many things, um, including uh, the need to save local news in our country and the importance of national news magazines. She um, has been part of the Kennedy School. She has a current podcast with Tom Ashbrook called Swing State. That's so many fun things. Would you please welcome our, um, our uh, interviewer, Heidi Legg. Here she is. Ian, thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, Heidi. I saw you sweating. That was tough waiting for everybody to be able to onboard. You did a great job, by you the know, way. Technical difficulties are never fun, but it just whets our appetite for what's about to happen. I, I don't know how you did it. I was, I was worried for all of us. I'm glad people are here. I can see the numbers climbing of participants, and I'm super excited to interview Amy Cuddy tonight. She's an American social psychologist, best-selling author, speaker, Harvard Business School professor. Her TED Talk has been seen 50 million times. Your body language may shape who you are uh, in 2012, based on her very best-selling, world-renowned book, presence. Um, but you know what people I think are going to learn tonight is that Amy understands there's much more to having just the presence. You have to have agency. And so I'm really excited to talk to her tonight about two new books she's working on. One, Bullies, Bystanders, and Brave Hearts, um, delves into the psychological causes and consequences of bullying in adults. Um, she also has uh, a book on public speaking we're going to speak to her about tonight. And She's doing this amazing thing during quarantine. At 11 o'clock every morning on Instagram, she has a writing hour and anybody can join it on Instagram. It's called allwrighttogether.com. Just follow Amy Cuddy. But I would really like to introduce Dr. Amy Cuddy, who I am personally very excited to interview tonight. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, and actually it's, it's called Quarantine Writing Hour. Um, and I do it, I do it on some weekdays. I was doing it every weekday in the beginning, but too much, but it's fun. It's funny that you Guest say that author, because it's very fun. we're seeing that people have become so creative during the quarantine in what's been an incredibly difficult and extraordinary moment for the whole world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I see people sort of went full tilt as they began different ideas um, and now sort of peeling them back a bit. Can you talk to us about that sort of so social psychology of how we deal with a pandemic like this and how we be, you know, you see someone like you being really resourceful and putting up this very positive thing for people to be part of. I mean, it's, I, I, look, it's, it's unprecedented for most of us, right? I mean, to, to go through something so dramatic, like such, such an abrupt societal change is not something that most of us have lived through. Um, so, you know, I can tell you what my experience has been, that, that we adapt very quickly. And, and I find that both um, reassuring and scary, right? That we can adapt to such an abrupt change so quickly is, you know, it's a, it's a good coping mechanism. That's how we survive. And at the same time, um, I don't want us to adapt so quickly that we don't notice bad things happening. You know, so it's, I think that's been really an interesting uh, dynamic that, that, that I've been talking to a lot of authors about. And uh, was thinking last week that it's okay if, if, you feel, if you feel like you're adapting pretty well. It's funny how many people feel guilty that they're adapting. Mm -hmm. If you're adapting pretty well, you know, keep at it, like do your thing, get it done, but set aside time to think about the people we're losing and the people who are really struggling. So I think uh, that's how I'm trying to, to do this is, you know, when I'm, when I'm on a, a roll, when I'm getting writing done and things are going well, it, you know, it's, it's in everyone's best interest, at least in my family, for me to keep doing that and in my broader community, but I also don't want to lose track of the people who are struggling. So I think uh, setting aside, you know, some time on Sunday, say, 
to think about the people that have been lost. I, you know, like I read the obituaries. I think it's really important. Um, I, 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 I really deeply care about the people that we're losing. And I see a lot of ageism and ableism in what's happening. And, and I don't want to disregard all these amazing lives that are being lost. Um, like Annie Glenn, John Glenn's wife, who died at 100 of COVID this week and was this great uh, advocate for people with disabilities because she's suffered from a severe stutter for, for most of her life. In her mid-50s, she, she got some help and was able to overcome it. But, you know, these incredible people, John Prine, right? Like just an right. incredible number of jazz musicians who were losing. So I think it's really important for us to both, both, both sort of allow ourselves to adapt as humans do and also set aside the time to make sure that we don't let ourselves be inured too much like i mean that, that, that we that we are still sensitized to all of the, the losses going on around us i think one of the gifts that you gave us all with your book presence was um not just the sort of explanation of presence and 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 that specific type of psychology of courage and um confidence but also to be able to step back and look at a situation and be critical about the thinking around it, to, to stop and be reflective. Huh, what's going on here? And you know, you have years and years of being sort of a, studying gender and studying racism and studying power over the powerless. Uh, how, how do you look at a moment like that, this right now, when we think about power? Who has it, who doesn't? Yeah, so I've been, I have been studying power and powerlessness in a way for decades. I've, as a, my main training is in the area of racism and, and sexism and other kinds of prejudice. And that's so much about uh, power hierarchies or what I would call social power. So social power is power over others and it's zero sum. You know, it's, it's fixed, it's finite. The more power one person has or one group, the less power another person or another group has. Um, it's about control of resources, for example, of limited resources. But personal power is more about agency, right? Personal power is our ability to kind of access our skills and abilities and strengths and virtues and bring them forth when we most need to. And I think that, you know, social power and personal power are not the same, but so lacking social power can certainly cause us to feel personally powerless as well. And we then sort of consent to that feeling because of the way power hierarchies work. Um, people, people end up deferring to those in power even if they don't necessarily subscribe to the power hierarchy. It's right. just the way humans behave. It's the way other primates behave as well. And so I think what people need to do is not be afraid of the concept of power, which is unfortunately linked to the concept of corruption. Uh, but the kind of power that they're thinking of is social power. And even social power doesn't corrupt in most cases. It has to interact with other factors like personality, societal circumstances, you know, whether or not this person is enabled to, 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 to behave in a way that's deceptive. So personal power does not corrupt. And it is in everyone's best interest for us to make peace with our feelings of personal power because our feelings of having it our feelings towards someone who has it our well i would say our feelings of uh, our feelings our feelings of power of our feelings of, of 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 being powerful of having agency our feelings that we deserve to be in a place just as much as anybody else that we are not less deserving than someone else just because they have more social power than we have right so i think that that that's um that's that's critical and part of it though is that people who are concerned about um the possibility that power corrupts are also more sensitive to not overstepping right those those things sort of are, are correlated and, and and so they don't necessarily embrace the the, the power that 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 they they could embrace so that's that's one of the the you know the the factors that I think is critical to overall well-being, because power activates what psychologists call the behavioral approach system. And that is sort of, so 
you could either be in an approach orientation or an inhibition orientation. When people feel powerful, uh, many, many experiments have shown this. There are lots of ways to, to bring people into a lab and, and experimentally manipulate them to feel powerful or powerless. When they're made to feel powerful, that approach system is activated. And what that means is that you are not in fight, flight, or f fight, flee, or faint mode. You are feeling relaxed, you're feeling strong, and you see the world not as a place that's filled with threats, but as a world that's filled with opportunities. So you might take the same challenge, and when you feel powerful, you see it as an opportunity to show people who you are or to really, you know, to be your best self. When you feel powerless, you see it as a threat. You see it as a, a moment when you might be found out for being a fraud, for example. Uh, the approach system also makes us feel more optimistic, more confident. Uh, it makes us uh, more creative. We perform better on cognitive tasks. We are also just simply more likely to act when we feel powerful. So we are more likely to take action. And in the context of you know, intervening to help on behalf of others, this is good. Right, so when I look at this in this work that I'm doing on adult bullying right now, the best predictor of bystanders actually interacting and, and stepping forward and saying something wrong is happening here is feeling of agency, right? So the feeling of agency. So when people feel agentic, when they feel that sense of personal power, they go, wait a minute, this is bullying and I'm, I'm not going to be silent here. I'm not just going to let this go on. I'm not going to watch this happen, right? So personal power helps not just you, it helps those around you, right? So, and I think, and then, you know, just the last piece is physiology. And it, when people feel powerful, I mean, just the bottom line is they live longer. They have a lower rate of stress-related illness. They have lower levels of circulating cortisol. They have lower self-reported stress. So power does allow our, 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 our system to repair itself uh, in a way that, that you know, gets blocked when we feel powerless. So all of that is under that whole umbrella of the approach system being activated. It's funny because you, you'll see some people who are in positions of power and we all can feel it, as you say, because there's, you're explaining to me, and correct me if, if I've got this right, they have agency and power. And so we gravitate to them. We, we want to be around them. We feel like the world is right with them leading, or we feel excited to be part of their team, or we feel excited to be in their company. And then there's other power where the person can be incredibly powerful, you know, be running a major system, and we don't feel so good with that person. But does that person not have agency or what's happening there? Well, I think, again, it's, we're talking about social power versus personal power, right? So I, I see agency as a critical component of personal power. So I'm kind of using those two words as synonyms. I mean, personal power to me is, is the, that the, the sort of mental state of being agentic. Um, now, I hear from a lot of people who have social power and don't have a sense of personal power. So they, they ha they're in a role that gives them power, but they don't feel that they deserve to be there. So they, you know, this is a imposter syndrome, right? Which is incredibly right. common. And so I think it's interesting that you could have social power and not have personal power. And those, those people are, you know, incredibly conflicted and not especially, uh, you know, pleasant to be around, right? They're not great at getting things done, but they're also more likely to be feeling kind of defensive and not open to say critical feedback or to- right. You're tiptoeing around them on eggshells. They're show. managing, right. Right. Right, right. so, yeah. you know, social power is, is not, um, you know, and on the other hand, there are a lot of people who have very little social power, but who are incredibly inspiring. I mean, right. these, are the, these are the people with personal power without social power, the people who overcome incredible odds, right? Who, who you know, keep going in the face of challenges, like of, of huge challenges, and we find those stories really inspiring, right? Those people tend to um, have a kind of calm confidence that we find not threatening, but reassuring.
You know, when I was doing a little research on you and listening to some of your earlier interviews and podcasts, um, I was delighted uh, selfishly to hear about you growing up in a small town because I too grew up in a very small town in Canada. And one of the things that I often think about now, especially in this moment when people are losing their jobs, struggling to put food on the table, uh, we have this incredible unemployment rate. We know things are probably going to get tougher for the next quarter or two. And um, in these small towns, a lot of people have agency. They have agency perhaps because they run the barber shop or the grocery store or, you know, the, the, they have a small business and it's a small place. So there's not some large uh, corporation that's sort of eating that up. And, and I wonder what we can learn about that sort of agency that you have when you can run something and own something and build something in a time when so many people are feeling powerless in this economic downturn? Um, well, I, I would say it doesn't have to have, it, it doesn't have to involve the transfer of money, right? So you can, you can, I, I do believe, so let me back up for a minute. People judge each other. When we, when we form an impression of somebody else, we're forming two impressions. The first is whether or not we trust that person. And we call that warmth in our research. Um, the other, the, and, and that answers the question, what are their intentions toward me? The second question that we answer is, are they able to enact those intentions? And that's power or agency, right? So someone who has bad intentions toward us, someone who, we, who we've decided is untrustworthy, and, but, but is agentic, is especially threatening. So I just wanted to sort of back up about yes, yes, yes. how so I sort of see these two, the agency fitting in with these things. But I also believe that, so those two dimensions, by the way, account for the, the lion's share of variance in our overall evaluations of other people. So if you were asked to rate somebody from one to 10, negative to positive, that rating um, would be largely predicted by how you rate them on warmth and confidence. So those, it's about 85 to 95 percent of the variance that's accounted for by those two traits alone. Uh, so they do, they matter a lot. Um, but I also think we have to ex people, but they show up everywhere. I think people also have to be able to express both warmth and connection and agency, right? So. So humans have a need to be able to express their love, like their feelings of connection with people. That's the warmth dimension. But they also need to feel that they're creating something, right? And, and I think that, for, for example, we, um, we see people in situations, okay, part of, part of the, the, the problem with a, a, a very traditional model, going back to maybe the 50s and 60s and 70s to some extent, where there were women who were staying home and completely giving up any possibility of working and, and um, were raising kids, but felt that they had no agency. Mm -hmm. You see them expressing their agency through their kids. So this concept right. of helicopter parenting to me is actually, it goes back to people needing to express agency. Right. right. So they have to create I something. I need a deliverable. Right? Right. And my kids are my deliverable. Right. And so I do think that people need to express agency and there's nothing wrong with that. So if we return to your first question about like being creative in this pandemic, you yes. know, the quarantine writing hour, I mean, for me, I, so I'm an author. Yes, I'm writing two books and I have two book contracts and I feel very lucky, but books take a long time. And book contracts pay out over a long period of time. My main income is from speaking and I have lost all of my speaking, right? Like right. all of my speaking is canceled for the entire year. So, you know, that's all of a sudden I'm like, okay, what? So, right. but I want to be doing something where yeah. I'm interacting with people. So that's how quarantine writing hour started. I'm like, well, what do people need? What do I need? I need a community. I need a sense of support and structure in order to write. So I'm going to create that for myself and in turn create it for other people. It started with a tweet. I just said, hey, like sort of to my author friends, is anyone needing a sense of connection? Do you want to set up like a Zoom group, you know, like with six or eight of us every day? And literally between LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram, hundreds of people were like, I want that. I want that. I want that. Because almost everyone 
is writing something like whether they're journaling or writing poetry or you know my son's a songwriter other people are writing memos and you know it's amazing organizations right like oh, great they're writing business corporate copy some people right. are writing books some people are writing op-eds all these people were writing and they were really feeling um like they were having trouble finding their motivation but Amy, uh, you have this approach and you know, um, I've, I've met you one time before this briefly. I don't even know if you remember, but you exude this warmth, but you also exude this competence and you've shown us that with your work. And so for people who maybe are feeling stuck in this very difficult moment, um, how do you go and develop agency? What are, what are the things you need to put around you to have the agency? You know, I feel very agentic as well right now, but there've been times in my life when I haven't. And are, are there tips that you can give to people? Yeah, where sure. They feel that, okay, here's my gift. Let me give it to the world right now. Well, first of all, let me just say, I feel like I go back and forth between feeling agentic and not agentic many times me over too. the course of a me day too. right now. So, so I mean, you know, an hour ago, I was like, what am I going to do about this thing? Talking to somebody. So don't get me wrong. I don't feel agentic all the time. Uh, but I am very aware of my need to, to feel and express that. So here's the thing. I'm going to call it personal power again. So agency, the personal power, your ability to kind of to get stuff done. Think of it this way. So you face these big challenges and you, you, um, you know, the way that you approach them and execute them and leave them is a, reflex, a reflection of how agentic or present or powerful you feel. So if you approach them with a sense of dread, so you're basically borrowing trouble from the future. Like you decided that it's already gonna go badly. And then you execute them with anxiety and distraction and you leave them with this feeling like, oh, I didn't show them who I am. Mm -hmm. That's the worst feeling. Like even, so say it's a job interview and you end up not getting the job. It's much easier to accept not getting the job when you at least feel that you showed up. You showed up. Right. Exactly, when you're like, well, you know what? I showed them who I am. It's obviously not a fit. I can move on. So that feeling of regret versus satisfaction is really telling you if you are feeling powerful and agentic in that situation. Now, the way that people get to this feeling of personal power really is about, I mean, there, there's so many ways that we can do it. Here's like a, this is a, there are what, what we would call um, kind of top-down approaches. So they're more cognitively engaging. So you could, for example, one way is to write about a time when you felt a strong sense of agency and personal power, not necessarily power over others, when you felt strong and agentic, write about that time, write about what, what was going on and how did it feel. That alone primes your sense of personal power. That will make you feel more personally powerful. I like the more um, bottom up kind of primitive approaches because we're not great at self-talk. So I don't know if you remember the the Saturday Night Live sketch, Stuart Smalley. Um, he used to say, I'm good enough, no, that I'm one. smart enough, and doggone it. Oh, yeah, 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 right, right, right. I'm smart enough, I'm good enough. Yes, so, daily affirmation oh, of Stuart it. Smalley, who was Al Franken, actually. Right. Um, but the whole idea was that self-talk doesn't work very well, because here's the problem. If you feel bad about yourself, if you're feeling powerless, but you're like, I'm powerful, now you just feel like you're powerless and a liar. Right? Like you don't trust yourself. Right? So self-talk is not the best way to get there. That's so if why I write I like, down something, I'm writing down like a time when I felt strong yeah, that, or a value. Yeah, you you know? really have to engage with it. You can't just like say, oh yeah, on that day I felt that way. You have to explore it. Like you've got, you've got to kind of journal about it, write about the time it, and, and, and really write through well, what was it about it that made me feel powerful in that moment. But I'm going to give you another way because I think I like these more bottom up primitive approaches um, that have to do with embodiment. People forget we are so divide, we divide the mind and the body in this bizarre artificial way that makes no sense to me given that the brain is literally situated inside the body and runs the body, right? So, so I don't know how we got to this mind-body divide, but we did. Now, the mind is obviously telling the body what to do, but people forget that the body is also telling the mind what to do. So the, the, the way that we carry ourselves changes the way we see the world. Now, when we feel powerful, 
we expand. I mean, it is across the animal kingdom in every culture in which it's been studied. For example, right, when people win first place, what do they do? Yes, repose <laughs> everywhere. Jessica right. Tracy, a researcher at the University of British Columbia, she studied this in three dozen cultures, including places where she hiked in, interacted with people who'd never interacted with an outsider, and still, when they won, they did this. Right. right. When we feel powerful, we take up more space. We breathe more deeply. We speak more slowly. In every way, we take up more space. Mm. So, you know, that's where this whole idea came from, that well, what if you turn that around? Because when we feel powerless, what do we do? We start to, we, we do what we call pacifying behaviors. We touch our faces and our necks. You know, if something bad happens, we go like this, right. we go like this right. to cool down our, you know, we, all kinds of touching, wrapping, making ourselves small, invisible. We don't want to offend the people in charge. We want to be invisible so that we don't get picked off by a predator. All of these things are nervous system responses that are great if you're being chased by a tiger. But the thing is, most of the time, most of the time, <laughs> we're not being chased by tigers. I, I, I recognize let's, let's now, talk, let's go to your book. Tiger okay. King. Okay, let's, most of the time, we're not being chased by tigers. We are just feeling socially anxious, right? So that fight, flee, or faint response is not helping us. What you need to do is override that. And it's hard to talk yourself out of it, but you can walk yourself out of it. You can change the way you carry yourself. That is called embodied cognition. And so if you expand, when you start to feel powerless, like honestly, pay attention to yourself. Like right now, everyone watching. I know, it's all you guys. Take some like, are you slouching? Yeah. Are your shoulders forward? You know, are you, is your chest collapsed? Are you breathing shallowly? You know, are you wrapping yourself up? Are you twisting your ankles, twisty legs, I call that? Or are you spreading out and feeling, you know, open? Pay attention to the times when you start to collapse and immediately change that behavior. Open up. You know, look, the nice thing about being home, not in front of a lot of other people, is that you can do crazy things. Like you can stand like so Wonder Woman. It's so right? true. <laughs> you can do the warrior pose whenever you feel like it. You're not going to offend anybody. Take up space. It changes the way you feel. A study just came out yesterday. I got the, the, sci the, the Science Daily News. A study with fourth graders in Germany where they had them power pose and found that it dramatically increased their self-esteem in general, but also their self-esteem around school, um, their, their mood and their interactions and relationships with their teachers, right? They felt a greater sense of agency at school. So th this, you could breathe more deeply, breathe more slowly. Let me give you one really simple one. So they call it four, seven, eight breathing. So you just breathe in for four counts, hold it for seven counts and exhale for eight. It doesn't have to be seconds. It can just be, it, but they have to be equal interval counts. That triggers oh, what we call the relaxation response. And it, 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 it calms your nervous system down. It sends you into rest and digest. So you start to feel calm and strong and confident again. Walking with longer steps, swinging your arms more, um, you know, All of that's going to calm simply up. sitting up straight, you know, with your shoulders back and down changes your mood. It lifts people's mood. It changes the way that they see themselves and others. So go for the embodied approach right now, because now is a time when we are feeling powerless. We're feeling uncertain. Many people have lost their work. We, do, we really don't know what's coming next. Many people have lost loved ones or they themselves are sick. There are so many pressures making us feel powerless. I'm gonna ask you to not consent to that feeling, right? So resist it, you're allowed to. There's nothing, no, why do you, you should not have to feel powerless right now. That's right. not your duty, you're not obligated. In fact, you should feel powerful right now. It's In fact, you could model, if you mo model these tools that you're giving us, it can be contagious. Which by the way, they're telling us we only have a few minutes left. Oh really want to ask you about bullies bystanders and brave hearts i know we're not going to get to read it for probably a couple more months but one of the things about raising a reader is that we're giving these books to children who perhaps are feeling bullied or feeling powerless or feeling isolated but this one you've written for adults yeah. so if we how do we address these bullies there's been a lot of bullying the last few years <laughs> 
front and center. And, and, um, and it's contagious. It's given the other bullies permission. So what, what do we do with that? So I, I mean, I can't give a simple answer. I'm, I'm going to try. I know. I'm going to tell you what I can tell you, what I can. First of all, very few people are the actual, what I call principal bullies. Like it's a small number of people who are really kind of sadistic and malicious. And those people, I, I actually am arguing in this book, we can't focus on them. We're not gonna change them very easily. We need to focus on the bystanders. That's most of us are, are allowing this to happen or signal boosting. So think of it this way, a lone bully is impotent. A lone bully is just a guy screaming. Right. And everyone's like, look at that crazy guy screaming. Bullies require mobs. Don't allow yourself to even quietly appear as part of the mob. So on social media, for example, when people start, somebody starts bullying someone, it looks as if bullying is the norm, but it's actually not. Most people are just saying nothing. You're hearing, they are the squeaky wheels, right? And when bystanders start to signal boost by retweeting bullies, they are becoming what I call accessory bullies. So do you want to be accessorized by these people? Because all you're doing is carrying out their agenda, which has nothing to do with you. So bystanders have got to learn the anatomy of bullying. And there is a, a course that, that it follows that's literally based on animal behavior. So Conrad Lorenz, the same guy that studied imprinting, also studied animal bullying, animal mobbing, and humans do the same kinds of things. So if we can see that happening and learn what kinds of, you know, um, logical fallacies, for example, bullies are using to trick us into believing them, we first have to inoculate ourselves against the bullies. Like, so we have to not let them accessorize us or use us in any way. Uh -huh. And then we have to learn what is the way to step in and reverse the norm. Right. To shine show our light the norm is bravery and not bullying. Right. So that's um, but I I'm it, that this book is with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And part of why I wanted to go with them is because they've got such a great education. It's it's with it's with HMH trade, but because of their educational division, we might be able to put together a young reader's version of that as well, or a young adult. That version would be so that. amazing. Yeah. I wanted to be able to be at a place where I can develop educational materials with the book. One of my fears as a journalist is, you know, we watch like you do as a social behavior um, expert, we watch society, we watch how things unfold and there's been so much bullying. I think if we go and study back word usage and images that have been in our feeds and the words and headlines, I, we've been inundated by this, by a sort of bully mentality. And I'm so excited for your book to come out. You're such a gift to so many of us, Amy. I really want to thank, thank you. you for your work. Thank you. Are, are, no, do, are there questions or how, I'm not sure what happens have, next? I, you know, they told me I only have a few more moments, but I have um, one question here that says, can we say that social power is fluid? That those with personal power can expand the pathways to social power? Can we move from personal power to social power? Well, it's, it's certainly true. easier to move from personal power. I mean, it's, it's, easy, it's easier to acquire social power when you feel personally powerful. That said, a lot of systemic biases right. make it hard for us to acquire social power. So that's the, the issue. I never want to, as somebody, like I said, who is by training a prejudiced researcher and very aware of the data, like very, very aware of the barriers that, that many, many groups face, I would never say, hey, if you feel personally powerful, then you're gonna get that job right. because it's an interaction of things. And, and we must address, I never want people's attention to be completely taken away from the systemic biases that need to be addressed as well. But yes, I do think that two things. One, when we feel personally powerful, we're more likely to acquire social power. But when we are, here, here's where I think it really matters. When people are working with, you know, um, communities in, in, in developing countries, for example, and they're focused on increasing well-being, they're often focused on increasing happiness and decreasing stress. And those are important, 
but agency and pow personal power are also critical components of well-being. And in fact, I think that without them, if you want to look at what happens in the next generation of that society, if you don't help people to find personal power and grow that, happiness and lack of stress are not going to change the status of that society, right? Like, so, so we, need, we need to help people find those sort of inner resources. Right, that agency. I'm so glad you're talking about bullying. I'm so glad you're talking about personal agency. Say it and keep going, girl. Thank you. <laughs> Amy Cuddy, um, I, sorry, I have to jump in. I'm gonna be a little agentic here at the moment um, and because otherwise the two of you will just get to talk for an hour, <laughs> which would be awesome. Um, but we did tell people that we would, you know, have a, an event that lasted a certain amount of time. Um, I do wanna ask you just one, if you don't mind, about mm -hmm. reading. And, and how your own, maybe even your own early experience of reading plays into some of what you're talking about and, and how it either makes you feel powerful or can you talk about that component and early yeah, literacy? Yeah, so I, I mean, I was one of those, like you couldn't get me off the, like out of, out of a book, kids. You know, like I, I, I would devour it all in one day and my parents would be like, you're gonna ruin your eyesight and you know, all that stuff. Like I just read and read and read. I, I read, I was so, I read a lot. I also journaled like crazy, you know, from, the, from a really early age. Um, so for me, I certainly love words and um, my friends even make fun of me for, I, I, I copy, copy edit myself out loud sometimes when I'm tired, I will, I, I say something and then I go semicolon, da, 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 da. They're like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, so I, I am a words and reading person. The weird thing though, is that because of my head injury when I was 19, the head injury made it harder for me to process visual information. So reading got harder for me. Um, so it's, it, I, I get tired faster when I read now than when I read before the head injury. Um, I don't know, but I love books. Like, you know, my house is filled with books. I, it's, it's, it, to me, writing a book is, is like this, one of the most sort of dignified things you can do. You know, like it's, it's your legacy. I want to leave something beautiful behind in words. And Unfortunately, we have audiobooks. Now we have audiobooks, so you can Yeah, listen. and I, it's funny, I, yes, which I like. And I actually, I did read my, I did do my own audiobook. And like, I, I read it instead of having someone else read it. And that was pretty, pretty interesting experience, but yeah. <laughs> It is. And is, and is that, I'm, is that a different experience? Hearing it is different than when you read in terms of your own post your, your accident. Is your experience of literacy different when you hear it? Yes. Yeah. And I, and I am as somebody who studies body language, which, which by the way, can be, could be a uh, vocal cues, right? So, so body language isn't just stuff you see, it's also stuff you hear that's non, the nonverbal qualities of speech. I'm really affected by that. So for example, I, I really strongly prefer books that are read by the, their author because it's mm. hard to read somebody. I mean, a, you could be a, a, have a great voice, but if they're not your words, you're not getting that sense of intimacy when you listen to it. Mm. So I have a strong preference for, for that. Well, we do have to end, but what you just said is sort of perfect because the model at Raising a Reader is the most intimate relationship between child and parent around literacy, where you have that person who is quite possibly the closest person as a young person, and then reading together, um, which I think you know, is, is also very empowering, not only for young people, but also for parents yeah. um, to get to do that. So, I know Christine is here and I want to turn it back over to her. Um, Christine, um, I know you, you wanted to say a few words to our incredible guests. Yes, well, thank you, Amy. I'm a huge fan and I feel like I was being chased by tigers <laughs> at the beginning of this uh, <laughs> event, no, but I don't worry, I've been doing my power posing since then and I feel much better now, so thank you. Um, but you know, I, I just wanted to say how wonderful it was to have you here with us today. Thank you for lending your time, um, you know, just to, to wrap things up, early literacy is a solution for a lifetime of productive, responsible citizenship. So thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. And you know, now more than ever, our families need the comfort and joy 
that books provide. So, you know, please help us build our library of, you know, age appropriate and culturally relevant books. Um, so we can continue building this critical early literacy foundation. So again, thank you so much to you, Dr. Cuddy. You, you were wonderful. Um, and Heidi, thank you. Thank you for all, thank you all for joining us today and um, be well. Before, before we all leave, before there's one, I have to remind people, next week we're gathering again for Live with an Author um, with Claire Massoud and James Wood. Come yeah. back uh, and join us next Tuesday. Thank you again, and um, we'll see you uh, next time with Live with an Author and Raising a Reader, Massachusetts. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye.